Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, July 21st, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. And I'm David Knight, and here are our top stories. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My yeah, friends all... my friends all have Lambos. How is a liberal media spinning the new undercover video? Then... Military recruiting centers nationwide are receiving threats, and we look at the number one threat to the environment. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. The allegation that Planned Parenthood profits in any way from tissue donation is not true. Well, I think Planned Parenthood is going to have a really difficult time talking their way out of this one. Now a second shock video of a top Planned Parenthood director has surfaced where they're discussing their baby organ trafficking scheme. And, you know, this time I think they're going to have a bit more of a difficult time convincing people it was just about storage costs and transport. Yeah, there's some very, very interesting admissions in this one, of course. The uh, liberal media is uh, circling the wagons around them. I call them the Planned Parent herd uh, <laughs> because that's essentially what they're doing is, is they're coming in very predictably, uh, defending this, saying there's nothing here, calling them hoaxers, saying this is nothing but corporate espionage. Well, we're going to play some clips and let you decide. Right. Now, in this newly released video, once again, it was obtained by the Center for Medical Progress, and this is the second video. They're, they said they have three in total, so this may not even be the most shocking of all. Uh, but this particular video is, again, showing another top uh, official. This is Dr. Mary uh, Garrett. What is her name? And she's basically the director there of Planned Parenthood. Uh, Gatter, I'm sorry, yeah, Mary, Mary Gatter. Gatter. Mm -hmm. And she's discussing haggling the price. She's haggling the prices like a used car salesman over these aborted baby parts. Take a look. What sort of compensation? What sort of... Well, why don't you start by telling me what you used to pay? Okay. I don't think so. I, I'd like to, I would like to know what would make you happy, what would work for you. Well, you know in negotiations a person who throws out the figure first is at a loss, right? So. <laughs> you, no, I, I don't look at it that way. I know. You want to play that game? I get I it. But I no, no. Wanna, no, I want... Low ball because I'm used to low things from... You know what? Um, yeah. This is amazing uh, because this is not just, this is compensation, this is profit, this is not recovering her costs. Yeah. What would what would work for you? Don't lowball it. Okay. Tell me what you really. Oh, that's way too low. I, I, and that's I, really that's way too low. Okay, so you can. You it will come out of that. So so here she's haggling over the price of this specimen. She doesn't want to lowball it. And I'm sorry, you don't have to lowball your costs. Your costs yeah. are your costs. You know what your costs are, and and if you're not out to make a profit, you say, well, this is what it's going to cost me. Exactly. You don't and that's to... key because the law says that they cannot do it for a valuable consideration right. of human fetal tissue. And, of course, that's one of the things that's so valuable about this particular, these, these videos, is that they like to call it fetal tissue. Mm -hmm. They like to not refer to it as baby body parts. And you can clearly understand that that's what's going on. When you saw in the last video, they're talking about the heart, the liver, the legs and extremities. We're talking about the parts of developed babies here. And of course, they have to get them at later stages so that the organs are as well defined as possible. That's one of the things that Abby Johnson told us when we yes. talked to her. Yeah, we spoke to her and that, you know, they're the little loopholes that they work through in Planned Parenthood. We're going to see this again in this next clip coming up. Um, basically, after haggling a little bit, they, they come to the c conclusion, you know, that they'll settle on $100. She's like, I'm not, we're not in it for the money. I just want to make sure it's worth my while, you know, so that's where they, they settle on that. Uh, but then this is where it gets a little bit sticky because she's blatantly in violation of protocol. She kind of admits it there and she's sort of describing how they're going to have to work around the protocol to alter the abortion procedure itself, even though, you know, they're not going to tell the women that that's what's happening to them. Are you looking at eight and nine week specimens or only second trimester specimens? You know, ten to ten to twelve week, you know, end of the first trimester. If that's if those are pretty intact specimens, then then that's something we can work with. So um, that's a, it, yeah, that's it, an interesting concept. Let me explain to you a little bit of a problem, which may not be a big problem. Mm -hmm. It may not be a big problem. Technique is <laughs> suction. 
yeah. at 10 to 12 weeks. Yeah. And we switched to using an iPads or something with less suction in order to increase the odds that would come out as an intact specimen. Mm -hmm. Then we're kind of violating the protocol that says to the patient, we're not doing anything different in our care of you. And to mm -hmm. me, that's a kind of a specious little argument Does that it? I wouldn't object. Yeah, kind of prevaricating around the bush. Question. Cases, yeah. Uh, to mm -hmm. use an iPass at that gestation so, stage in order to increase the odds that he was going to get an intact specimen. But I do need to throw it out there as a concern. As a concern, because, because yeah, see, they're patient. saying the patient is signing something, and then we go on to say, yes, indeed, this is the type of care you're going to receive. And, of course, we saw in the last video, uh, the, the other director there, uh, Nukutella, she also mentioned how they would sometimes... Uh, shift the baby around so that it would come out breach. Yeah, in and order that's to a big deal. Head and I don't think that they're getting the informed consent of the patient for that. It certainly didn't sound like it when she was talking about that last week. And of course, presenting the baby into a breach birth uh, position, turning it around, is a hallmark of the illegal partial birth abortion procedure. Right, and and that's the other thing you bring up with with them using this fetal tissue and everything like that. I mean, I think if they would really explain that to women who, you know, go to check that off, you know, do you mind if this is used for research? If they actually maybe explained it in a way, then you would visualize, oh, wait a minute, you're you're going to take the intact skull and the, the liver and, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's just, again, they're kind of dancing around the terminology. Well, it's also very different when you're talking about organ donation, if somebody's killed in an automobile accident or something like that, uh, versus a situation like Planned Parenthood, where they are encouraging women to have an abortion. And let's understand, that's really what is going on here. Right. And so when you create a situation and then turn around and profit from it, and we're gonna talk about the profit aspect of it here in a moment, because that's the pushback that we're getting from the Planned Parent herd that is defending these people. Well, let's go to this next clip. It's, it's really short, just because uh, last week, the director of Planned Parenthood came out and finally apologized for the video, but she really just apologized for the tone and maybe it wasn't correct. So I wonder what she thinks about this tone here. Some mistakes were made. And then if you want to pursue this mutually, I'll mention this to Ian in terms of how he feels about using a less crunchy technique to get more whole specimens. Less crunchy. Yeah, yeah. Because, because they need to keep those parts intact mm -hmm. there so yeah. she can really get that, get that money. Um, you know, when they're talking about less crunchy stuff, one of the things that Abby Johnson had said that, that she was employee of the year and uh, just before she quit in 2009 uh, in the region, the Planned Parenthood region where she was, the reason she quit, Leanne, was because she saw an ultrasound of the abortion procedure. And this was a 13-week-old fetus that was trying to actively move away from the abortion instrument, and she had been told mm -hmm. that they couldn't feel anything. And so when she saw that, this, the whole thing is based on lies and deception. And that's what we see being spun about this. That's the thing. When you're talking about the fact that she quit immediately after that, she became a whistleblower, essentially, a defector, they say, but all, really a whistleblower as to what's going on. That's what caused her to quit. And now they're talking about the crunchy bits. They're talking about, we want to present them around here so we don't have to crush the thorax, the main part of the body. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just gruesome beyond description. And yet these people are profiting from it. They're making a great deal of money just off the abortions. I mean, when she jokes about the Lambo, and that's the clip coming up, you know, that that is a joke, but these people are highly paid abortionists. Right, and, and you talk about the media circling the wagons. So uh, last I checked, ABC still hadn't even put up a single article about this story. Um, MSNBC said, you know, more, more of a uh, sting videos to come. This time they could be racially charged. So nothing about them selling baby parts, nothing about joking about, you know, how she wants to get herself a Lamborghini. Um, but then the Daily Beast, their headline is, hoaxers fail to nail Planned Parenthood in new video. And so they're basically going and debunking all the things that you supposedly see in the video. Uh, talk about there where she's saying, you yeah. know, they were talking about $100, well, but they never settled Daily on Beast, uh, you know, they use the term hoaxer. They talk about this being corporate espionage and everything. But... When we talk about whether or not this is for profit, one of the things that they say in their article, they say, well, U.S. law prohibits valuable consideration of human fetal tissue, but it does allow, they say, and they quote the law, reasonable payments associated with transportation, implantation, processing, preservation, 
quality control, or storage of human fetal tissue. Now, if you watch this video, you will not see any of those things discussed. That's not a part of yeah. any of their uh, of, of their uh, of what they're going to provide. They're not going to provide storage and plantation processing, preservation, transportation. They're not supplying any of that. As a matter of fact, there's a clip in, in the interest of time. We won't play it, but there's a clip where the lady is talking about someone from Novogenics, and here's the exact quote of what she says. She says Heather from Novogenics would come to our site. Heather would look at the tissue. She would take what she wanted. So logistically, it was very very easy for us. We didn't have to do anything. So there was compensation for this. Now look, that is valuable consideration. That is compensation. They did nothing. They were already paid for the abortion procedure. The lady comes in, she inspects it, she does everything she wants to to the baby and then takes the remains with her. They aren't doing anything. So that is selling it. Now, Abby Johnson said, Leanne, that when she looked at this, she says, well, I'm not sure that there's any laws being broken. I think this is possibly a loophole, a gray area. I disagree. I think there are laws that are being broken here, but at the very least, the Center for Medical Progress that did this has at least brought it to the public to understand that maybe there is some more explicit wording that needs to be done. There is a gray area. We are seeing babies ripped apart and sold off for profit. And as we saw last week, they even take pre-orders for this. Right. I mean, that's... <laughs> and, and uh, you know, one of the things the Daily Beast is talking about, you know, they never settled on this $100 amount, and, and it's obviously to deal with the cost, and she's obviously joking when she talks about getting rich off of this. Play that clip. It's just been years since I've talked about compensation, so let me just figure out what others are getting, and if this is in the ballpark, and that's fine. If it's low, still low, then we can talk about that. You would. I want a Lamborghini. <laughs> I said I want a Lamborghini. <laughs> she wants a Lamborghini. Don't we all, right? And see, and that's what it is, is that the Daily Bee said that she never settled on that $100 amount, but she, she was shocked when they offered her more than the $75 that she put out there. And the lady was like, no, that's way too low. We were going to start at least at 100 And then so she's feeling confident and cocky, and she's like, we'll check and see what the other Planned Parenthood agencies are getting. And if, if that's... If that's too low, then we'll bump it up. So then you can pay us even more for these specimens. So again, no cost. She's just really feeling like, you know, she took this person to the cleaners and now yeah. they're going to be getting this large compensation, possibly being able to buy herself a Lamborghini. Ha ha ha. That's such a funny joke. They're going to recoup their costs. They're going to make a profit. And there's a lot of money in this. Uh, as the uh, article from the Washington Times pointed out when they were talking to Abby Johnson, the National Institutes of Health spent $76 million last year funding grants for research using fetal tissue. So some money is going to come from there. But they also point out that Planned Parenthood had revenue of $1.2 billion, $1.2 billion in 2012-2013. About half of that, $540 million, came from government health, health services grants. That would be your taxpayer money, and reimbursements, which I'm sure is what they're talking about, selling tissue. Right. Okay, selling baby parts. You know, and we know the media is going to do a horrible job covering this, just like they did a horrible job covering uh, the Kermit Gosnell case from last year. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility for parole. Very uh, little coverage. He was a doctor. Those are the baby parts. That's what was found in his basement. That's how he's storing baby parts. That's what it's called for fetal tissue there. You can see he, he would collect these little mementos of baby's feet and keep them in jars in the freezer. And this is, this is how they're storing. And, and uh, Kermit Gosnell, you know, when he would do these late-term abortions, obviously he would prey on minority and immigrant women. That mm -hmm. was his, the mainstay of his, of his practice. And, uh, you know, obviously probably maybe that's why these women weren't able to say, whoa, this place is disgusting. There is blood everywhere and cat urine and it yeah. smells like dead babies. Um, he was making more than a million dollars a year because yeah. his late term abortions would cost anywhere between $1,300 and $3,000. Like I said, they're highly compensated. And you understand that the patient or the government or donor has paid for the abortion. They either have to get rid of the uh, body or they can sell it off as parts for profit. 
It's the same kind of situation wind up with the uh, aluminum industry, the nuclear industry, dumping their toxic waste fluoride into our water supply. Otherwise, they'd have to pay as uh, toxic waste to clean it up. But of course, Leanne, they're already spinning this because they know more stuff is coming out, as you mentioned at the beginning. That's the way the media is going to handle this for them. They're going to say, well, now the next thing is they're going to call them racist. We don't have to call them racist. We know what is behind this. Yeah. There was a story on Drudge Report from the American Mirror saying, Black Lives Matter, really? Well, apparently not in New York City. There were 25, 24,000 uh, babies born in New York City that were black. 29,000 were aborted. And of course, this goes all the way back to Margaret Sanger herself, the Negro Project, saying we want to exterminate the Negroes, but we don't want them to figure this out. If they start to, let's use black ministers to pull this back. This is a long, long history of yeah. eugenics and genocide and just flat out murder. Right, and that's, that's what's disgusting to me is that MSNBC, once again, the media, they're not talking about what the story is. The story is the spin. And so for, for them, they're basically preparing you for what's going to come out next week, which it's probably, if I had to guess, they're going to be talking about, you know, if, if, if you receive more compensation based on race or something like that. Who I knows? Mean, you know, the thing is, Leanne, on the inside, all the babies are the same. Right. Yeah, you know, it's just a skin color issue. But Margaret Sanger doesn't see it that way. It's disgusting. Well, thank you, David. Thank you. Now, coming up, we're going to be talking about an InfoWars exclusive. Uh, we are getting word of military recruitment centers being actively threatened, and they're still unarmed. Armed Forces recruitment centers across America are reporting that they're receiving violent threats in the wake of last week's shooting in Chattanooga. Now, this is according to staff who spoke directly with our reporter, Joe Biggs. Now, Biggs traveled to the U.S. Army recruiting station in South Park Meadows here in Austin, Texas yesterday. He was there all day as well uh, again today um, to provide armed protection as part of a nationwide movement to protest the fact that the law prohibits active duty members who work at such facilities from having weapons. So they are <laughs> capable of handling weapons and protecting the country. Uh, but once they get back, the only people that are allowed to have guns are the violent criminals who are going to go and attack them. Now, a lot of people are really upset about the fact that within hours, the White House was somehow able to arrange all of the colors of the White House to be lit up like a rainbow for the gay marriage decision. But it took five days to lower the flag for the dead Marines. Obama only made this decision after intense criticism. And people were wondering, why didn't he lower it like he had in other mass shootings? So a lot of people were really outraged with this, kind of telling because, like we said, uh, he took the time out to honor those dead Marines only after he wished everyone a happy Ramadan from the White House. And now, not only are they keeping guns away from the recruitment centers, but also they're uh, working away now with the FBI and the VA to get veterans' guns taken away from them. And that's really anybody who gets Social Security. Now, these documents were obtained by The Daily Caller, and Alex Jones spoke with a journalist who broke this story, Patrick Howley, today on The Alex Jones Show. So joining us is Patrick Howley. Patrick, I tell you, uh, this is bold. This is bold, and of course, they're going to camel's nose under the tent flap like they did with Clinton and the vets, but this is intensifying. Uh, the vets just complain, yeah, suddenly I can't buy guns. Then you get in New York, California, and Illinois, where they're more bold, they have the state federally funded task forces. They come and say, hey, uh, we don't need any trouble. We're just taking your guns. We're taking you in for psychological evaluation. Don't give us trouble or we're going to have to arrest you. Um, your medical records show that you were given a designation 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. And it's not that you even are mentally ill or considered violent. It's that you just had some type of psychological counseling. I mean, this is so draconian. You've really ferreted into this. You've really dug into this. What can you tell us? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me and thanks for highlighting this issue because a lot of publications wouldn't. Um, the Los Angeles Times picked it up uh, just recently, but uh, a few weeks ago, essentially, I started this off by obtaining a memo through a source from inside the Federal Bureau of Investigation um, showing that the FBI um, and they broke this down. Every month, the Department of Veterans Affairs sends a CD-ROM disc uh, with the names, new names each month of veterans who they feel should be on the National Instant Criminal Background Check uh, list. 
Now, these are people who did not commit crimes. These are not criminals. These are not people who should be on the national instant criminal background check system. But these are people who the VA has determined through their own uh, counseling services and their own VA health services. So if these veterans actually do manage to get off the secret paper waiting lists and get in to the facilities to get a real uh, doctor's appointment, they uh, just might say something or do something that will set off the VA. The VA will put them on the list. The FBI does not uh, review these cases. The FBI does not investigate these cases. The FBI uh, merely takes the CD-ROM disk from the VA and immediately puts these people on the National Instant Criminal Background Check system, um, and, and it's up to the VA. So we know that the FBI and the VA are working together on this. Hundreds of thousands of veterans have been put on the National Instant Criminal Background Check system without their knowledge for things such as um, you know, switching their bank account to auto pay or debit card. They don't want to cash a paycheck because nobody does anymore. So they just have the their um, pension and benefits put directly onto their debit card. So that um, is enough to get you onto the list. Having a nurse in your house to cook for household chores if you're old or injured, that's enough to get you on the list. As far as I'm concerned, that those are the kind of people who need guns because, you know, if somebody breaks into their house, but that's enough to get you onto the list. The AARP he is definitely on board with the, the Obama agenda 100%. I mean, they're one of his biggest supporters. The funny thing is, and it's not funny, but I use that term in a dark way, um, is that a lot of these things, like having a nurse or uh, switching your payments to debit or, or all these trivial things that get people on the list, were suggested to the veterans by the VA. Uh, I've talked Shut to veterans up. who said, I didn't need a, a nurse to come by. The VA said, you do need a nurse. We've decided that you need a nurse. We're going to give you one. The veteran says, OK, and then the VA puts them down on the list. Now they have a nurse. So it's the VA actually driving these numbers. Um, but, you know, now, uh, as, as we know, uh, my source has come back with even more documents and found that ATF is now involved. ATF is now working behind the scenes with the FBI on enforcing these cases. ATF, I mean, your, your viewers uh, know ATF very well. Uh, the, this is the enforcement arm. So we know that the FBI and the VA has been putting these people on the list. Now that they're on the list, ATF knows about it, and ATF can come and knock on your door, and they're going to have guns when they come. Anything you say related to the Social Security Administration, anything you put down on your medical records, that can now be used against you to send ATF agents to your house to take away your guns. And President Obama, who's in the uh, last days of his presidency, uh, and who has a media who doesn't report on this kind of thing, um, it, you know, it's just going to start enforcing this. And what can people do? With the clock ticking on 18 months left in his presidency, President Obama is determined to cause considerable damage to the Second Amendment rights of the good citizens of the United States before he leaves office. You know, I've been very clear uh, that, you know, an assault rifle ban, you know, banning these uh, high-capacity clips background checks, that there are a set of issues that I have historically supported and will continue to support. But will there be resistance? Absolutely, there, there will be resistance. Uh, I'm going to be putting forward a package, and I'm going to be putting my full weight behind it. The LA Times reported the push is intended to bring Social Security Administration in line with laws regulating who gets reported to the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, or NICS which is used to prevent gun sales to felons, drug addicts, immigrants in the country illegally, and others. A potentially large group within Social Security are people who, in the language of federal gun laws, are unable to manage their own affairs due to marked subnormal intelligence or mental illness, incompetency, condition, or disease. Roughly 4.2 million Social Security beneficiaries will be dropped into the same database system that the Veterans Administration is using to come and take it. My primary care physician called to have a wellness check uh, uh, placed on me, and the local police perform a wellness check. Well, the local police came up, and there was nothing wrong with me. I had no, um, you know, there was no anxiety. I wasn't uh, combative. Uh, I basically, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't with anybody, so I had no witnesses, and they didn't have a warrant, and they, uh, in, with, through intimidation, forcefully uh, commandeered my vehicle and entered my home, searched and seized my weapons, and um, then, you know, carted me away in an ambulance 
to uh, uh, a psychiatric evaluation, which I was held for 72 hours. Determining whether someone is unfit to carry a gun will be open to sloppy interpretation, as it could include those who don't pose a danger to anyone, but may not be able to remember names quickly or balance their checkbook. Databases are being created on every red-blooded American whether you own a firearm or not. The New York Post reported, unbeknownst to most Americans, Obama's racial bean counters are furiously mining data on their health, home loans, credit cards, places of work, neighborhoods, even how their kids are disciplined in school, all to document inequalities between minorities and whites. Hang on for a second. Obama, your white mama is of mostly English ancestry. You are essentially a white man. You're not Martin Luther King. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. The American people were making racial progress long before you and your merry band of socialist divide and conquer engineers showed up. And I personally resent that you would have me divided from my fellow Americans, whom I love. While our borders are wide open and we are increasingly under attack by foreign and domestic terrorism, not by veterans or grandpa protecting his small piece of the American pie, but by radicalized Muslim extremists and pharmaceutically induced psychotic Americans, all of which are roaming around gun-free zones, Obama wants our guns? I can't think of a time when Americans needed them more. And according to the recent explosion of gun sales, neither can Americans. John Bound for Infowars.com. Hi, I'm Rex Jones, reporting for Infowars.com. I'm here at the Greenbelt in Austin, where most people here think that pollution, such as littering and runoff, are the two biggest problems in our world today. And if you look around here, that's easy to see. There are things such as empty beer cans, beer bottles, abandoned shirts, abandoned pants styrofoam cups, all sorts of pollutants. We've picked up a little bit of garbage from our surrounding area, but this is just a small version of the landfills and dirty creeks and rivers that the government likes to paint in our head as an idea of pollution. What they're really trying to cover up is much bigger than a little landfill. In fact, it is starting to consume the whole world. What is it? You're about to find out. We talked about garbage on the ground. But what about the garbage in our rivers and streams? This garbage is called runoff, and it drifts through our whole planet's water system of rivers, lakes, and oceans to form a giant trash continent in the Pacific Ocean, which I'm going to coin Gargia. Is Gargia the biggest threat to the environment today? I think not. But before we leave the water, let's separate the facts and myths of the Pacific Island Garbage Patch. First, it's not a giant island of garbage as depicted in this picture here. It's actually made up of very small and microscopic pieces of plastic that covers 5,000 square kilometers in the North Pacific gyre. So the jet stream and southern trade winds create a giant circling region of water. Another myth is that plastic is killing animals. While it's true that plastic is being found in the stomachs of dead birds and fish, it's not yet known if the plastic is the actual cause of death. Also, small water insects, crabs, and barnacles have thrived on the particles and are now found in abundance across the ocean. In addition to being an eyesore and potentially deadly to marine life, runoff is not the biggest problem we face in our environment. Now let's take to the skies and cover a different kind of pollution. Air pollution has been with us since humans first learned how to harness fire. In 1952, pollutants from factories and home fireplaces mixed with air condensation killed at least 4,000 people in London over the course of several days. A few years earlier, in 1948, severe industrial air pollution created a deadly smog that asphyxiated 20 people in Denora, Pennsylvania, and made 7,000 more sick. Acid rain, first discovered in the 1850s, was another problem resulting from coal-powered plants. Regulations and technology have helped clean up most of these problems, so now pollution is not as much of a problem in developed first world nations. In China and other emerging countries, air pollution is a huge problem and it's spread through the jet stream. Mercury, 
black carbon, dust, and ozone are just a few of the pollutants that are carried by the jet stream over the Pacific Ocean and are being dumped in the United States. Currently, China is building up to four dirty coal burning power plants a month and consumes over four times the coal than the United States. Obama led EPA regulations that will shutter most of our coal burning plants by 2030 so you can look forward to the higher power prices and breathing the dirty air produced by China. Another environmental danger is called CCD or colony collapse disorder. This happens when a hive of bees is unexplainably wiped out. Nearly all CCD is being caused by either RFID radiation or Monsanto pollen that bees carry to other normal crops. Albert Einstein once said that if the bees were wiped out, all of humanity would vanish within four years. Recently, Harvard researchers linked pesticide use, specifically neonicotinoid insecticides, to act as nerve poisons and mimic the effects of nicotine as a major cause of colony collapse disorder. Over the last six years, American beekeepers have lost 30% of their hives each winter on average. And as companies like Monsanto keep producing neonicotinoid insecticides, future colony collapses are guaranteed. Now let's look at an unseen pollutant, nuclear radiation. We don't know what the exact full fallout from the nuclear bomb testing and leaks from nuclear power plants are. But the issue was brought to the forefront when the Fukushima power plant reactors melted down after a tsunami hit Japan on March 11, 2011. Since that time, countless gallons of radioactive cooling water has poured into the Pacific Ocean. Radiation spikes have been found along West Coast beaches, and there are more and more reports about massive sea life die-offs and dead zones being created in the ocean. You can't see the radiation, but the effects in the rise of cancers and birth defects in Japan is a direct result. It's disasters like Fukushima, Chernobyl, and Three Mile Island, or a full-scale nuclear war that could potentially end all life on Earth but it is not the biggest threat to our environment. Now that we've covered litter, runoff, CCD, particulates coming in through the jet stream, and nuclear radiation coming from places like Fukushima, I'm about to tell you what I consider the biggest threat to humanity is, GMOs. The real danger is not what is seen, but what is unseen. Not only have GMOs been linked to numerous health problems, but the pollen blow off from Monsanto farms to other normal farms is causing unseen and unprecedented mutation within the normal biosphere. Everything that we've talked about before this, we knew the dangers and we knew how to deal with it. But with GMO crops, the answer still remains a mystery because we don't know what's going to happen within these mutations after three or four generations have passed. Here's our friend Jeffrey Smith to talk about GMOs and their dangers. Of all of the toxins that are released into the environment, GMOs are of a special class. You see, with genetic engineering, you have pollution of the gene pool. It's a self-propagating genetic pollution. The genes that we released in this generation already can outlast nuclear waste. They can go on forever. We have no technology to fully clean up this type of pollution. Certainly, we can reduce it dramatically. But until we have some technique to identify GMOs at a distance, we are stuck with GMOs possibly forever. Imagine being hired by a company that says, we have a little problem, we'd like you to organize the recall of our salmon from the ocean. There's a company that wants to introduce genetically modified mosquitoes. Imagine trying to do a recall there. GM pollen has already contaminated the indigenous corn varieties of Mexico, and we have no technology to clean that up. What we've done is irreversible damage. And this is something that is highly irresponsible, unconscionable. And it was done over the objections of scientists, over the objections of science, a collusion between government and industry. There are two main reasons why people genetically modify foods. They either drink poison or produce poison. The poison drinkers are called herbicide tolerant. Most popular variety is Roundup Ready. Let me explain. Monsanto's scientists found bacteria growing in a chemical waste dump near their factory, surviving in the presence of their herbicide called Roundup. So they had the brilliant idea, let's put it in the food supply. So they took the gene from the bacterium that allowed it to survive applications of Roundup and put it into soybean, corn, cotton, canola, etc. So now you can spray the field with Roundup 
and it kills all of the other plant biodiversity in the field, but not the Roundup Ready soy and Roundup Ready corn. The other variety of genetically modified crops produces a poison. If they take a gene from a soil bacterium that produces a natural insecticide and put it into the DNA of the plant, so every single cell of every single plant in millions of acres has its own little spray bottle that can kill an insect by destroying its digestive system. What these changes mean is that the plant might produce more allergens, more toxins, more anti-nutrients, more carcinogens, or even less of these. We don't know. It's a genetic roulette. In fact, the process of approval of these GM crops do not evaluate these type of changes. In Monsanto's own studies, which they conveniently left out of their published paper, which we were covered later, they found that in cooked GM soy, there was as much as seven times more of a known allergen called trypsin inhibitor and about a doubling of an anti-nutrient called soy lectin, which blocks the absorption of certain nutrients. In genetically modified corn, a gene which is normally switched off was switched on to produce an allergen, and other proteins were truncated or changed in shape, which can change a harmless protein into a potentially deadly one. In fact, when they looked at that corn variety, they found 43 different proteins that had significantly changed their levels of expression because of the genetic insertion. So these could be caught wreaking havoc with our health or the environment, but no one has evaluated them. Genetically modified foods and crops are one of the most dangerous health and environmental catastrophes we're facing. And yet very few people know about it. Now you know why we here at InfoWars believe that GMOs are the biggest threat to our planet today. We know the true dangers of a cigarette butt left flying out unattended in a field. But do we really know the dangers of GMOs? And can we trust our government to tell us? I'm Rex Jones reporting for InfoWars.com. Well, now we're going to discuss the double-edged sword that is technology. Now, no doubt the future is going to be a, an entirely different place. They're going to have a lot of really positive technological advances, uh, but we're going to kind of look at the history of some of this technology, which seems to have some pretty nefarious roots. Uh, just off the top of my head, I can think of all the mind control technology that we've heard of in the past. Uh, MK Ultra and CIA mind control. Uh, now, my guest today is going to break all of this down in depth a lot more. Dr. Nick Begich, he's the author of Controlling the Human Mind and Angels Don't Play This Harp. I believe we still have uh, Angels Still Don't Play This Harp in the InfoWars store. That one's on special, actually, two for the price of one. Check that out for sure. Dr. Begich, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. So what is your definition of technology? What is its purpose going forward in this really bizarre future we can kind of see for ourselves? Well, I mean, as I evaluate technology and, and why it's always been important to me is fundamentally within a, a, a democratic republic, running your government requires a little bit of knowledge. And technology is, in fact, what makes governments powerful and strong in the 21st century. When you think about you know, the power of, of governments, really, it's, it's supported by the power of modern technology. No matter how you view it, uh, those with the technology uh, control the program, so to speak. Absolutely. And just kind of paraphrasing a, a Brzezinski quote, he talks about a more controlled society would be the result uh, uh, with this link to emerging technology everywhere, and, and you nailed it. So what are some noteworthy uh, devices and experiments that people should be aware of? Well, the, the big, you know, when you think about uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski's ideas about uh, controlling um, human beings, he, he wrote a book called Between Two Ages back when he was at Columbia University. And he talked about that more directed and controlled society, that society that would, that would emerge out of technologies. And what he said was, whether it were liberals or conservatives, they would have different rationale for using the technology for our own good, right? Uh, because this is... Uh, the nature of it, you know, so you've got uh, this this type of leadership on the liberal side and the conservative side that both believe in a more directed and controlled society for maybe very different reasons, but the outcomes um, are the same. Uh, what we have seen is that drift, um, the direction of, uh, of drift from um, really a society that could function uh, freely to one that, think about it, all your medical records, your purchases, your credit card transactions, your bank transactions, your social interactions on the computers, your searches, all of that. Now imagine all that being collated, dissected, and analyzed 
and then the ability to manipulate your personal behavior um, becomes possible because in the, in the data feed you get uh, can be more controlled, more directed to trigger uh, your emotional state, to trigger uh, what sort of fires you up. Uh, very simple things can be applied once knowledge is obtained, and, and what we see now is this sort of wholesale grabbing of data, and really what needs to be protected um, is, in fact, our information, not just what's in our heads, but all of the things that we do that are tracked and cataloged uh, should be looked at the same way as things within your household. You know, the, the idea of personal privacy used to be the, the front door of your home, and today, it's your digital doorway. It's what enters the data into, into the record. And that should be protected just as vigorously as the front door to your house. Right. And can you briefly describe a little bit of uh, Jose Delgado's work experimenting with electrodes in the brain and, and his wireless experiments and all that? Yeah. You know, Jose, Jose Delgado started um, University of Madrid uh, class in 1950. He got his degree in electrophysiology to study electromagnetic fields on the human body. He then um, went to uh, Yale University, where, where he worked for a number of years. And in the 60s, what he was doing was essentially mapping the brain, determining what parts of the brain did, did different things, and then implanting electrodes, uh, first in animals and then in, uh, in humans, to see if you could stimulate um, effects by stimulating with radio signals parts of the brain. Now, this was done with implants um, back in the 60s and early 70s. By the 1980s, um, Jose Delgado had developed technology where you needed no implants whatsoever. The only thing that you needed to do was stimulate the brain with really, really low energy densities. I mean, energy concentrations at one fiftieth of what the Earth naturally produces. I mean, this is just such a small amount of energy, most people would discount it, not even consider it. But it was found that just like dialing into a radio station, when you get right on that station and you get uh, harmony between the transmitter and the receiver and you get a nice clear signal, the same thing happens with the human body. And as soon as you transit that resonant signal that couples to the human body, that's where the effects occur. So it doesn't take a lot of energy. And Delgado was kind of the leader of this, showing that with very, very light amounts of energy, you could create huge outcomes. Another gentleman, um, Persinger at Laurentian University in Canada developed similar technologies and found that you could trigger all kinds of events. Um, what he suggested in a mid-90s paper was that if you could just put a signal out that created a certain sense of agitation or dis-ease in the population, and then did something as simple as just run um, a normal news feed that perhaps indicted some group or some person for being the sort of the cause of all your ills, a certain amount of the population's emotion would be directed in that in that way. So in situations where you just need a few percentage points to kind of move outcomes, very effective technology. And Delgado was sort of the root of a lot of this um, science in terms of what the public is aware of today. Now, when you talk about this wireless energy, I mean, are we talking about the same type of electromagnetic frequency that is being emitted with Wi-Fi signals? Any signal can be modulated where they can put a signal sort of on that. You know, would use the Wi-Fi signal as a carrier and then put a modulation on it that um, will couple with the human body. You can use any electromagnetic carrier. You can use computer, radio, television, um, the electric grid itself. Uh, to create these kinds of effects. You can create the flicker effect. You can use um, um, electromagnetic fields. You can use any, any part of the spectrum if you can oscillate and modulate that signal in just the right way, and they can. And that's, and that's the root of the technology. Again, it's, it's not the amount of power. Um, it's the way you modulate, manipulate that energy that causes the coupling or, or the um, resonant effects in the human body. And then, so, you know, obviously the military use of microchip implants. Uh, let's talk about, you know, where they're going with that. And also, if you have any idea that the corporations and top producers of these type of technologies, who is benefiting uh, by creating these? Well, the, the, the idea of implant technologies has been around a long time, you know, for, for tracking things. I mean, certainly it's, it's kind of like the individual barcode, right? I mean, it, it, when you government of uh, Mexico and their attorney general's office, over 200 people were microchipped to track all their movements and activities. 
Um, these microcircuits can also uh, determine a lot of things about your vital functions, in terms of your body functions. Um, the idea of, of being able to, to track the movements of individuals, um, you know, that's kind of the, the beginning of it. Uh, but as again, as technology gets finer and finer and more sophisticated, you can do a lot more uh, with it, being able to um, trigger events. But again, the need for an implant is is um, is being pressed, like in special forces uh, today, uh, to to take an implant if you're going to go into a combat situation, so that if you got lost, they could find you. I mean, I can see the validity of that if I were going into you know, into a combat zone, and I want to make sure no matter if I strip down naked, they can still find me, right? Um, but that's, you know, that's a real exceptional uh, use of technology, a very specialized use. The idea of cashless societies and, and, and implants is something that people have talked about uh, forever. And you see this, this, this sort of feed. First, you get this new technology that's so wonderful it's going to protect you like magnetic strips on the back of a credit card, and then all of a sudden that's no good, so now we have microcircuits on credit cards. Eventually that's going to be no good, and it's going to be, well, let's make sure that we really know who this is by putting something in you um, and being able to track that. That's, that's one idea. The other is just monitor your, your biology. I mean, look at your iris, look at your fingerprints. I mean, biological data is also um, an identifier that, that is often used. But when you see this sort of, again, the coalescing of technologies, um, you see the direction is really towards a more directed and controlled society, ultimately using the military often as guinea pigs for these experiments, which has been done historically. Even Secretary of Energy O'Leary during the Clinton administration admitted over a half a million Americans were used as experimental guinea pigs for various programs. Many, many of them, um, military personnel, um, as well as, as other people that really didn't have the right or ability to speak up for themselves. Military are constrained um, in, in many ways from being able to, to object uh, to this kind of um, activity. Well, all very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Nick Begich. Thank you for having me.